Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Wiking Wee School of Communication and Information at NTU Singapore, I'd like to extend my warmest welcome to everyone right, to this uh, inaugural Leading Lights speech that we name after Professor Ev Rogers. Uh, some of you may still wonder, you know, uh, who is uh, Ev Rogers and why we have these two okay, uh, speakers today from Texas and also from Jakarta. The goal of our Leading Lights uh, lecture series is to showcase intellectual uh, luminaries, okay, such as our uh, two speakers that you will uh, meet uh, very soon. But first, uh, why Ev Rogers? The answers to me cannot be more clear. Professor Ev Rogers is a unique scholar, mentor, and educator who has left a wide-ranging and enduring impact, not only in communication and information studies, but in many other academic fields. Important is to note that we are celebrating you know, his work and life here because he was among our school's first chair professors for two terms as the Wee King Wee chair professor in 1998. I know some of you are not born yet, <laughs> but this was part of our school history, but also as the Nanyang chair professor in year 2000. Without him, our school probably would not have gained such high international prominence so early on. Ev is, by my account, the most influential communication scholar of his generation. His one book, now the classic masterpiece, Diffusion of Innovations, he has many other books, okay, but just this one book has gathered more than 140,000 citations by colleagues in communication and media studies, and also across the social science, sciences, engineering, business, and medical disciplines. Right, so I challenge you to find another book of a similar impact. I just cannot. So why now? Uh, some may uh, still wonder. Professor Ab Rogers passed away 20 years ago in 2004, in this month of October. So that's, we are marking a very special uh, moment to remember and renew his legacies, to celebrate his impactful work and reimagine the future possibilities of communication and information studies with more bravery and more grounded connections with our Asian and especially Southeast Asian neighbors. With this, we will start with a video from Dr. Corinne Scheffner Rogers, Professor Rogers' life partner. After this video, my dear colleague Ben Dittenberg will introduce our first inaugural speaker, Professor Arvin Singel. After Professor Singel's lecture, my dear colleague An Peng Hua will offer a short commentary before we open it up for Q&A. After this, uh, Peng Hua will introduce our second speaker, Professor Doreen Awangji, before she delivers her lecture. After that, I will uh, give a short commentary before we have the second Q&A. At the very end, uh, very importantly, okay, we have also a reception with uh, drinks and snacks outside so that you can intermingle more with our leading lights luminaries. So now the video, please. Hello, I'm Corrine Scheffner Rogers, wife of the late Everett Rogers. I'm talking to you from the study that Ev and I shared in our home in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Thank you, Jack, for the invitation to say a few words to open the Leading Lights lecture series honoring Ev. This type of event is a true testament to his legacy as a scholar and influencer. When I received this invitation, it immediately brought back wonderful memories of the summers that Ev and I spent at NTU when he was the Wee Kim Wee professor in 1998 and the Nanyang Distinguished Professor from 2000 to 2001. During this Leading Lights event, you will no doubt learn about and discuss Ev's pioneering work and scholarship. You may also hear about his life journey from poor Iowa farm boy to a globally recognized and prolific scholar of communication, diffusion, and social change. What you should also know is that he was a charismatic storyteller 
who loved engaging with and learning from people from all walks of life. He was equally at ease meeting world leaders, such as we can we, as he was interviewing homeless people for a research project in California. His preferred method of teaching was through storytelling. He was masterful at weaving together things that he learned and sharing them in a way that drew in audiences and motivated them to engage with one another to discuss important issues. Ev was also a lifelong learner. He absorbed new ideas and experiences like a sponge. He especially loved trying new technologies. He bought the first Macintosh computer, the first Palm Pilot, and other first technologies that eventually landed in a box in our garage. He enjoyed consulting with companies on how to diffuse early versions of innovations, for example, electric vehicles and solar panels, and then bringing those experiences into the classroom. When Ev wasn't in the classroom teaching, he spent his time meeting with faculty and students to discuss their research. His office hours were usually held at the canteen or at a restaurant over coffee, lunch, or snacks. During our time in Singapore, his NTU colleagues introduced him to many new foods, which he reported on to me in detail at the end of each day. Everyone was especially indulgent when it came to teaching us about durian fruit and having us try scorpion at a local herbal restaurant. Consequently, Ev and I became oddly obsessed with going to markets around Singapore to buy fruits and other foods we had never before seen, and then figuring out how to eat them. Ev was an enthusiastic and adventurous explorer and eater. Ev's legacy goes beyond the seminal works that he wrote and the lectures he delivered to the kindness he role modeled. We traveled the world together and met former students and faculty colleagues wherever we went. I was continuously awestruck by his razor sharp memory that enabled him to recall details about each person, their family, their scholarship, and his connection with them, much to their delight. After I've passed, I received an outpouring of letters from people whose lives he touched, some of whom I'd never met, who mostly spoke of his kindness and how special he made them feel. That is the mark of a generous scholar and a gentleman. Ev's contributions are not only foundational, but also incredibly relevant in our rapidly evolving global landscape. I'm sure he would be humbled and very happy to know that you are gathering to engage and discuss his theories and works as they relate to today's world. Thank you for creating the Leading Lights event to honor Ev's life work. I wish you a thought-provoking and fruitful time as you delve into his scholarship. Good afternoon, colleagues, students, friends. When Jack asked me to introduce our speaker today, I was um, to share a few words about Ev Rogers. Uh, I was both touched and honored I knew that Jack understood my personal connection with Ev and what it meant to the school to have him uh, be a part of us, our, the Week in We School, in its early days. Although I am an old timer here at Week in We, my history with Ev goes back much farther. Although I had never heard of communication studies, my undergraduate advisor suggested that I take COM1, a very popular course given by a charismatic lecturer. Within a few weeks, I realized that I had, I had found my intellectual home and Ev agreed to become my undergraduate advisor. As a consequence, I got to know Ev in the 1980s, and our connection continued for decades, and was renewed through his visiting appointments at We Kim We. I have numerous stories to share, but in the interest of time, I will spare you. Professor Arvin Singel is a prolific author and a longtime collaborator of Ev Rogers. He is the Samuel Shirley and Edna Holt Maston Endowed Professor of Communication and Director of the Social Justice Initiative at the University of Texas at El Paso. He also holds numerous courtesy appointments at other universities around the world. Arvin conducts research on the diffusion of in innovations, entertainment education, and many other topics related to communication and social change. His work crosses disciplinary boundaries and promotes social justice. The research has been supported by many of the top funding agencies around the world, and he himself is a global traveler, having lectured in scores of countries in Asia, Africa, Latin America, Europe, and North America. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Arvin Singal to give his talk on the life work of Everett Rogers.
Thank you, Professor Ben. Uh, such a pleasure to be here at uh, NTU, and I'm looking at Professor Jack and uh, thinking about uh, the first time we met. Uh, it was at the same institution where I first met Ev Rogers. We met in the summer of 2000 when uh, Professor Jack, at that time a PhD student, uh, made the mistake of taking a class that I was teaching at the Annenberg School, and Professor Ang Pengwa and I were colleagues uh, at the University of Southern California's Annenberg School uh, in the mid-80s. Uh, I have memories of uh, Professor Ang Pengwa and I working in the computer lab, toiling away uh, past midnight, uh, and how nice to have my dear friends uh, represented here. I know Ev is smiling down, yeah, I'm quite sure. Uh, I just landed in Singapore uh, four hours ago after being uh, in transit uh, home to hotel 30 four hours, so if uh, you see signs of delirium or, uh, uh, you know, uh, blanks such as uh, this, uh, you can just uh, blame it on my circadian rhythm uh, being a little out of whack. But that's the kind of life Ev Rogers lived uh, as well. I hope you'd allow me to tell a few personal uh, stories uh, of Professor Rogers so that we can talk about his work, but also take a sort of a biographical approach. And through his wife Corinne's beautiful introduction uh, and Professor Ben's uh, beautiful connective sinew, as also uh, Jack's, you've already begun to get a sense of who the man was, but perhaps we can extend this. So I want you to reflect a little on an Iowa farm boy who's probably dressed in his best clothes. Uh, and his journey uh, to become uh, the most, or one of the most cited uh, social uh, science uh, scholars of all times. And after me, I know Professor Dorian is going to talk about his work particularly, but I'll set us off, okay. Aha, okay. Actually, let's see, can one go back to? One can. To set the stage, I know there's a long title. Uh, I want to tell you a story, Ev Rogers loved to tell stories, about President Abraham Lincoln. I'm sure uh, you can picture him. He was a very tall man, and he was the 16th president of the United States. And the story goes that in the battlefields of Gettysburg during the Civil War, a Union soldier who for the first time was meeting the president walked up to him and said, you know, first saluted and then shook his hand and said, oh, Mr. President, you're tall. How tall are you? And Lincoln, without batting an eyelid, said, Son, like you, I'm tall enough that my feet reach the ground. Now, uh, the answer really should have been, I'm six feet, four and a half inches tall. But Lincoln, and I'm going to repeat what he said, he said, son, like you, I'm tall enough that my feet reach the ground. Now, I've reflected on this story quite a bit. I'm, an, I'm a student of uh, Lincoln's uh, work. And whenever I narrate this Lincoln story, I think of Ev. Lincoln also was a poor boy from Kentucky who grew up in a log cabin never really went to formal school, although he educated himself, much like Ev kept on educating himself. And even though he was at that time the president, the commander-in-chief, 
and apparently a very tall man, in talking to a Union soldier, he said, son, like you, I'm tall enough that my feet reach the ground. A certain sense of the familial, a certain sense of deep humility. And that is something which all of us who have been in the presence of Ev Rogers have always felt that he was the top communication scholar, the most cited social scientist, the Janet M. Peck Professor of Communication at Stanford University, but when you met him, he had the deepest humility, as some of our utterances, I think, are making clear. I was very fortunate uh, that at age 22, I was admitted, again, mistakes are made, uh, into the PhD program at the University of Southern California. And it was that year that Professor Rogers moved from Stanford University to take on a position at the Annenberg School at the University of Southern California. And two of us in our entering cohort at USC Annenberg School, Jim Deering and I, we both were admitted to Stanford. And can you imagine as a 22-year-old uh, having a full fellowship for four years to go to Stanford and to work with F. Rogers, and then only to learn that he was no longer going to be at Stanford. So we both made our applications quickly uh, to the Annenberg School and then end up there. And the good thing was that F. Rogers, when he moved from Stanford to USC, he did not have any trailing students which is, you can imagine, for us, you know. So Jim Deering, my colleague and I, we would walk up to Ev's office, room 206, Annenberg School, 306, Annenberg School, and sweet talk his secretary into giving us all the free time that he had. And uh, Ev was never shy of uh, filling our schedules with responsibilities and accountabilities. And we pretty much had him, uh, you know, uh, for, for five years. So he nourished us in ways that was a function of time and space. So if you have an admission to Stanford, I suggest you pause. Mm -hmm. And if you can find a mentor, uh, go uh, trail him your life will not be the same. OK, so our journey lasted from the first day that I entered the Annenberg School in 1985 uh, until uh, October 21st, 2004, when he passed away. Hmm? It was a journey of two decades. Uh, uh, this picture was taken in September of 2004, the second one. Uh, so I had the unique opportunity of visiting with him two times in the last uh, few months of his living and spending a few days uh, with him. Our journeys took us around the world, uh, from being in uh, five-star hotels to being in rural India. And if we were in rural India and we got this beautiful, colorful headgear, Ev would insist that we continue wearing it when we arrived at the airport to take a flight. And you can imagine, you know, uh, two, uh, well, uh, 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 an American white tall man professor wearing a paggar, as we call it, uh, with his, you know, uh, student. Uh, it certainly, so that was Ev, no? When it came to trying new things like scorpions or durian, uh, well, he was very uh, effusive, uh, let's say, with his uh, desire to try new garb. He was a person who was always at work. I mean, I can't remember a time when he wasn't working. And if you asked him, Ev, how come? Uh, he would go back to his Iowa farm days. You know? He went to a one-room school. 
And then, of course, before he went to school, you had to do the chores. You know, you had to milk the cows, and you had to feed the hogs, and you had to, you know, grease the farm machinery. And this ethic of work that he embodied, I'm actually trying to, it's been almost 40 years, I've been trying to wean myself off that ethic. But it's very hard because it is so programmed in your DNA that you're continuously uh, sort of... Uh, so these two pictures, uh, the first picture on the left, the black and white, is at a bar in the Indian city of Bangalore. And that picture was taken in 1987. And if you're wondering what we are working on, we both seem to have pens, we are working on the outline for our first book, which was titled India's Information Revolution and which was published in 1989 when I was still a doctoral student. So we saw slides where uh, we saw Professor Eddie Ko and Professor Ang Pengwa, you know, Ev's work on Silicon Valley. Well, we were in Bangalore, India in 1987 because we were seeing it emerge as Silicon Valley. And of course, it's very important if you want to know where the innovations that drive this communication and digital revolution come from. They come from places where you have entrepreneurship or research university. So all the conditions that create the possibility. So that was Ev's expanse. Wasn't just interested in how to spread messages, but where does the technology we creates the conditions for us to communicate in ways that we do come from. He was interested in that chain of thought. The second picture is from Costa Rica. We were there for a conference, and this is his hotel room. And uh, on a long bus ride, two and a half hours, we pretty much thrashed out the outline for a book, Ben, that you have lent out and still have not gotten it back, which happens all the time to professors. Uh, we were working on the outline for the book, Entertainment Education. And by Ev's expression, I think he looks pretty happy. No? Uh, the book did pretty well, uh, and uh, clearly I'm eager and excited, but he's probably uh, dictating to me, ah, make sure we put this case in, make sure we... So that was the kind of person he was. He gave uh, numerous lectures. I counted we traveled together to 18 countries uh, on all, on five continents, um, when a week before he passed, I received a big package in the mail from him. And it was his updated CV. He was very good about updating his CV. And it came with a little sticky, a post-it note, which said, Dear Arvind, you have been my closest collaborator. Cordially, F, which is how he signed and so we had the pleasure of writing five books together, 35, I counted, uh, peer-reviewed uh, journal articles or book chapters, several grant applications, and we probably made hundreds of presentations together as perhaps one of this. This was uh, a workshop that we were doing on diffusion and, the, uh, and diffusion of new products in Indian markets. Uh, in the year 1990, I believe. So, very modest evenings uh, on an Iowa farm. Do, are you liking these pictures that I've pulled up for you? Yeah? Uh, that's uh, a picture of the Pinehurst farm which his father uh, had. It's a picture from the 1930s, I believe. Uh, at that time, when Ev was born, and Ev says that he was born the day the Great Depression started, March 6th, 1931. It was around that time. And uh, Pinehurst Farm, 220 acres, didn't have uh, running water, uh, electricity. Uh, you had to go to the outhouse uh, for uh, sanitation. 
And as I said, life was tough. Uh, besides the howling winds, uh, Ev went to this one-room school. Uh, this school has now become a museum. So you see a picture of him and Corinne with Ev's sister. Very stark resemblance uh, to Ev. Uh, sort of visiting their school. So this one-room school had multiple grades. So you could be in grade one, two, three, four, five, six. And, you know, depending on uh, what tasks you needed to cover, you got that attention from one or two teachers. Mm -hmm. So Ev must have been pretty good about his uh, work habits, uh, because there was much more to do besides school. Growing up on the farm, he had never really thought about going to college. But Ev credits his high school teacher, his name was Pep Martins, who packed a bunch load of promising high school students and drove them to Ames, Iowa, from the community of Carroll where Ev lived, a distance of about 30 miles. Ev had never been to Ames, Iowa before. And I'm so glad that uh, uh, his high school teacher uh, drove him to uh, Iowa State University, and he decided that he would get a bachelor's degree in agriculture. But how do you pay for it? He joined ROTC which is uh, you enroll for the services and you're trained. So he graduated while he was getting his, getting his bachelor's degree in agriculture as a second lieutenant and then a first lieutenant with the US Air Force, served during the Korean War. And the GI Bill, as a reward, offered him a scholarship to do his master's and PhD work. And so he enrolls in a master's degree and enrolls in a PhD degree. And by age 27, he has his PhD in rural sociology. This is Ev's father. Once again, probably this is preparing for his Christmas uh, dinner with the family. This is not the way he looked all the time. Uh, but Ev always talked about what a reluctant and unhappy farmer his father was. And that is because he had inherited the farm, and so it needed to be farmed. And he was more interested in electromechanical innovations, new you know, mechanical harvesters, for instance. He had no interest in biological and chemical innovations. But this is the Great Depression. Iowa, you know, is a, uh, it has loamy soil and was a wonderful place uh, to grow uh, produce, to grow food, to grow corn and soybeans. But it also experienced numerous droughts in the 1930s, the year the decade that Ev was born, and also, we've heard about the Dust Bowl, numerous episodes of locusts, grasshoppers, just completely devastating fields. So if you have an interest in electromechanical innovations, but not in biological and chemical innovations, then you, your crops are not doing so well if you are not adopting hybrid seed corn, you know, which is a more robust biological, you can say, in some ways, innovation. And his father was very reluctant to adopt weed sprays or locust sprays, which are chemical innovations. And Ev saw this in his childhood. And it just happened to be that the state of Iowa was the home of many of the agricultural innovations that came to be. So Ev is known for his work on the diffusion of innovations. And Iowa, when it came to agricultural innovations, was leading the pack. 
And uh, there was a very famous study, uh, the Ryan and Gross hybrid seed corn study, where new varieties of hybrid seed corn for corn had been developed, which delivered 20% more yields, where the stalks were sturdier, so you could mechanically harvest them, and they were drought resistant. Yeah? But it was surprising that when the Ryan and Gross study came out, even though hybrid seed corn offered significant advantages, it took an average farmer, the average time taken for them to adopt it was 10 years. From the time of becoming aware about the innovation to the time of actual adoption. And this puzzled, you can imagine, a young man growing up on a farm, getting a degree in agriculture, studying how new ideas and innovations spread, and seeing at home a reluctant father, and seeing all around him the resistance to change, even though innovations had, on the face value of it, several advantages. So that during his master's and his PhD work, became a subject of his investigation. How come some farmers adopt agricultural innovations more readily than certain others? Because I've already told you, for hybrid seed corn, the average time from awareness to adoption was 10 years. In 1962, after serving as a professor of rural sociology at Ohio State, he was a rural sociologist by training, agriculture and sociology, you know, how ideas spread in a social system. Ev took the work, the literature, in the realm of innovation diffusion, but not just in agricultural innovations, in all other fields, and basically expanded the review of literature chapter of his dissertation into a book. And that classic book was Diffusion of Innovations. It was published in 1962, and as Professor Jack has noted, uh, five editions, uh, a citation classic. It's considered by Inc. Magazine as being one of the top 10 most influential books in business of all times. And of course, for us as communication uh, scholars, you know, many people say, ah, here's my Bible. I remember being uh, in Alosatar, the northernmost state uh, of Malaysia, uh, visiting some rice farmers. This is 25 years ago. And the extension officer, when they heard that I was Ev Rogers' student, drove me to their office and from their cupboard pulled out a mimeographed copy of the Diffusion of Innovations book. And, you know, that to me was in some ways, uh, if you were talking about global reach, uh, you know, clearly Ev's work uh, had uh, made it. So that's Ev Rogers interviewing farmers, and uh, this book came out in 1962. And you have to remember, this is the time when lots of countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America are becoming independent. Uh, there is a tremendous thrust post-World War II on the spread of agricultural innovation so that the world could feed itself, and newly independent countries like India and Peru and others are trying to diffuse innovations in nutrition and health and, uh, you know, family planning and et cetera, et cetera. And this book came at a time providing a very useful framework, as we were talking, Professor Dorian, uh, for taking an innovation, a new idea, a new practice, and finding a theoretical basis or a framework uh, for its spread. I couldn't find uh, an image, uh, Jack, of the second edition. 
So if anybody finds, uh, and I, I have a copy of all the other four, but uh, not the second edition. So if you have a mimeographed copy, uh, Professor Ben, uh, lying uh, in your basement or in your uh, attic, uh, please uh, do uh, digitize it and uh, send it uh, to me. Uh, this is the version of PowerPoint uh, in 1974 when Ev is making a presentation. Uh, you know, these are cards, and he had a little uh, sewing uh, needle uh, and using that as a sort of a pointer. Uh, and uh, uh, he clearly was making an uh, impact. Now, you probably know all this, but his contribution, even though he was not involved in the early studies of diffusion, like the hybrid seed corn study that you know, came out in 1943 of work that was done in the 30s, but in his doctoral dissertation, he reviewed 405 studies. He basically would go to the card catalogs and figure out, okay, innovation. So if it, there was a study on educational innovations, he would dig that out. You know, if there was a study on new product diffusion in marketing, he would dig that out. If there was a study on the diffusion of a news event, he would dig that out. If there was a study on the diffusion of a certain virus, epidemiology, he would dig that out. So his review of literature basically tried to see the commonalities. And it provided him with what became known in 1962, once the book came out, as the classical diffusion paradigm. Because what F found is no matter whether it's an educational innovation or it's an epidemiological uh, study or whether it's the diffusion of a new product, there were several commonalities. And what were the commonalities? For innovations that did diffuse, they followed an S-shaped curve, most of them, not all. And what does that mean? It basically means that initially the innovation diffuses very slowly because not everybody adopts at the same time. Remember, hybrid seed corn, it took an average farmer 10 years, but it does mean that there were some farmers who adopted within a year, and there were some farmers who adopted not even after 12 or 15 years, right? So uh, initially, very slow adoption, and then something happens which makes the innovation take off. And Ev, through his work, basically was saying that this happens when people begin to look over the neighbor's hedge. And if my hybrid corn is standing tall, my neighboring farmer may say, how come mine has wilted during the drought and yours is standing tall? And now you begin to make those decisions. No? So the whole notion of opinion leadership, that people are led by the opinions of others whom they trust and respect because they are similar to you and you know, so the hybrid seed corn study by Ryan and Gross showed that the early adopters were influenced by salespeople and influenced by extension workers who were promoting this. And the people who adopted early were young farmers, more educated, who went to the city more often, who were a little more cosmopolite, yeah? Uh, but the older farmers, more traditional, they mostly relied on uh, word of mouth. So you can see it's a generalized case of innovation diffusion, how new ideas spread. And some ideas spread very slowly, then take off, and some innovations may not even take off. In fact, many innovations die, right? So this S-curve is only relevant for innovations that do diffuse. For instance, taboo innovations. What are taboo innovations? Where people are only talking to a few people, where there is some element of stigma. Those don't diffuse very rapidly. They actually diffuse very, very, very slowly. Why? Because you 
don't ever get this radial network of diffusion which makes the innovation take off. It spreads through interlocking networks. So HIV AIDS, testing. Why is that that takes a long time? Because you wouldn't want to be seen being tested. Or why do programs such as clean needles for harm reduction for substance use disorder spread very slowly? Again, it's a very taboo topic, right? So depending on the nature of the innovation, and Ev theorized all this, right? Different kinds of innovations, what makes some of them take off, what makes, you get the idea. And from a communication perspective, now this is important. Why should we study the diffusion of innovations in a school of communication? Because diffusion is a very special case of communication which basically means that there are types of communication which are not diffusion. Because diffusion of innovations means that the new idea, if I tell you something that you know nothing about and if you perceive it as new, you have a little more uncertainty about it, right? As opposed to something that you already know or that you expect. So obviously there's higher risk. So it's a special case of communication because you're dealing with the newness of the idea which creates, which creates hybrid seed corn. Why should I adopt hybrid seed corn if I'm using the open pollination varieties and I've been using them for the last 20 years? Yeah, you get the idea. So the newness of the message and the uncertainty that it causes makes it a special type of spread. Also, if it is an innovation, if it is a new idea, the source of the innovation obviously knows a lot more about that new practice than the ones who are going to adopt. So the source is more expert, more heterophilous, and that creates problems, right? Imagine, I mean, you know, so it's risky, uh, here's a young woman telling a relatively older man, ah, this is what you need to do, right? Now, they're not the same. They come from different backgrounds, different levels of expertise. So not only is there increased uncertainty, but there is tremendous amount of atrophy, as I would say. Uh, and that's the reason why opinion leaders work well. Look over the neighbor's hedge because your neighbor is like you, is more homophilous. Anyway, I, this is just to give you a sense. I mean, of course, this is about uh, 120 years on the timeline, and that's the reason why you see some of these S-curves, uh, but they take off. I mean, if you expanded the time frame... <laughs> Not to be 120 years, but you know, if you took one innovation at a time, this is just to show the comparative spread. And the rate of change, of course, the rate of adoption for technologies that do diffuse is speeding up, as you can see. I've already said not everyone adopts at the same time. What fascinated me personally about the diffusion of innovations paradigm or Ev Rogers' work when I went to work with him is that if you are a student and a scholar of change, social change, organizational change, the diffusion of innovations perspective gives you a way to think about change. There's no change if things are the same. So for things to change, there have to be new things that have to come in. So diffusion of innovations and the reason why it has wide applicability, whether it's in Alostar or whether it is the work that you're doing, uh, Professor Dorian, has applicability because it gives us a way to understand, analyze, conceptualize, predict change processes. And that's the reason why it is so relevant. And diffusion allows you, this framework allows you to conceptualize change at the level of a social system, sort of a more sociological or epidemiological perspective, and also at the micro level. 
psychological processes. What makes one person adopt sooner? What's happening in their head? How come they go from awareness to adoption so quickly? So all the way from micro processes to meso processes where you're talking in small groups to macro processes. And this is in some ways the beauty of this approach, no? or at least the way I understand it. The reason why people find it so useful. How am I doing on time, uh, Professor Jack? Five more minutes? OK. So the work that I did with Ev Rogers was to bring in, in some ways, a sort of a new element to diffusion of innovations. Ev became very interested in the use of popular media, entertainment genres, soap operas, telenovelas, games, as a way of spreading social innovations. And that was very interesting to me. How can you turbocharge the process of diffusion in ways to address deep societal challenges using the diffusion of innovations framework by introducing new ideas? So I want to share with you, this is a case that uh, Ev was very familiar with. I did a lot of work in South Africa in the late 90s. Uh, and here, the challenge was the problem of domestic violence in South Africa. And I'm just going to cut the story uh, short by giving you the highlights. In our study of domestic violence in South Africa, and believe me, this holds for all cultures where there's domestic violence or partner violence, the man, if that's the abuser, always feels in control in the privacy of my own home. I can do whatever. And I will put her in her place. That's the story, the idea that the man plays in their head. The one who's abused, the woman, in the privacy and the sanctity and the safety of her own home, she feels violated. We look upon the domestic sphere as being a safe space a roof over my head, but it is here in this space that she is being violated and the cycle of violence escalates. She wants help but cannot ask for it. Yeah? Why? Because you cannot wash your dirty laundry outside of your home. That's her perspective. That's her story. And what about the neighbor's story? The neighbor's story, neighbors know what's going on, especially if you live in shanty towns. Domestic violence is loud, you can see you know, blue and black marks. But they don't say anything. And why don't they say anything? Because it's a private matter between husband and wife. So old ways of thinking, the man in charge, I'm going to put her in place, the woman being violated, but I cannot ask for help. The neighbors know, but they don't do any. The old ways of doing things are stuck. So in a very popular entertainment education soap opera in South Africa, we played this storyline of what exists. And then in one of the episodes, built it up, when the man was about to smack his wife, this time something changed. Something new happened. And this is happening on media in a very popular television program. What changed? The neighbors came out of their homes. This is a fictional soap opera. You can make them do anything. They came out of their homes with what? What do you see? Pots and pans? Does every home have them? Yes. And when they came out, of their pot, came out with their pots and pans, what did they begin to do? They began to bang them outside the abuser's home. Now think about this. The man who thought he was in private space just because he could close the curtains and shut the door and do whatever, is the private space still private or has it become a little public? It's become a little public. How about the woman? The b banging pats are telling the man, the banging pots are telling the man what? Stop, we see you. What are the same banging pots telling the woman? We are there. 
for you. We know what's going on. Yeah? So can, does she feel that she's being violated and nobody is listening? No, that's flipped. And the neighbors, how about the neighbors who previously felt that they wouldn't do anything because this is a private affair between man and wife. Has that changed? Yes. Is it one person banging a pot and pan or is it the, it's the whole community? Ha ha. Okay, so just think about it. The power of entertainment, a fictional space, a symbolic space, go back to the work of Albert Bandura at Stanford, social modeling, social cognitive theory. You don't need real role models. You can have popular entertainment role models who show you a new way to tackle domestic violence on a very popular soap opera. So what do you think begins to happen? We begin to hear that communities, multiple communities, in black townships, whenever there's a situation of violence, people are coming out with their pots and pans and are back. Where did they learn this from? Where did they learn this new mode of dealing with domestic violence from? From the soap opera. Yeah? Diffusion of social innovations practices by taking the principles of diffusion theory and subverting, changing the story. Yeah? So it didn't surprise us that in bars, when men were beginning to be abusive to women, patrons would get up and begin to bang their beer bottles. Where did they learn this from? Yeah, this mark. You get the idea. So this is the kind of work that we did with trying to create new possibilities and why it wasn't one person, yeah. because now we are showing collective efficacy. One person cannot do it, but the group can do it. And if you're trying to change a social norm, if you're trying to bring in an innovative practice, it's far better to show the community model it, as opposed to one person model it. You get the idea? I mean, so in essence, what we are saying is you take this simple notion of diffusion of innovation, turbocharge it with entertainment and good writing, do your research to understand what the existing stories are, and create the conditions for those stories to be changed. Ev Rogers, a global public intellectual, we've said that, you know, from books on communication networks to intercultural communication to a lot of work in terms of documenting the history, traveling all over the world with his curves. This is a picture from Ecuador. Uh, my favorite story when I visited Professor Musa uh, at, uh, is it UKM or UPM? UPM, Putra, University of Putra. Uh, he had a picture of him with Ev Rogers. He was his master's student at Stanford, which was right on his desk. And then in a conference in Toronto, we just discovered that there were seven of us who were students of Ev Rogers in the same room. So we got together and took a picture. Intellectual leadership, you may recognize Mr. Michai. You know, Ev was very active. Uh, the gentleman on top right, he's the Bill Gates of India, but he was a student at Stanford, so of course you get to enter his office very easily. And Ev was an everyday humanitarian. He always signed his notes cordially, Ev, and he loved using stickies. Now stickies, <laughs> post-it notes, are a phenomenal innovation. You know that, right? Because it's a, it's a, Adhesive that doesn't stick, right? And that's beautiful. You know, 3M, the company was trying to make an adhesive that would really stick stronger and ended up making a product which didn't really stick too well. And as opposed to throwing away the idea, they said, could we do something about it? And so now you can imagine, Ev loved this because how wonderful are they in diffusing messages? You know, you're seeing them 
This was written like 40 years, maybe 40, 35 years ago. It is permanently impermanent. Yeah? It is, and they are addictive. So I've actually got some F. Rogers stickies. If some of you are interested, come talk to me during. He was such a good man. I helped him with a little conference. And the next day, there's a big uh, package for me. And what does it say to Arvind with my thanks for all your help with the conference? Cordially, Ev. And do you know what that had? Brooks Brothers, you know, it's a very, uh huh. It was a $250 tweed jacket for a poor graduate student. Yeah, that is how generous uh, the man was. I'll just end, uh, Jack, with uh, two little small messages that I derive from Ev. So that's a picture of Ev with my son on top, who's now 31, and with my mother. Uh, he always stayed when he came to India. He came to India about 10 times uh, at my house. And my mother, this is sort of the farewell, the going away uh, tika. My mother's also wondering what Ev Rogers is doing with these letters which we found and you know, sorting them out. That's sort of his research enterprise. But one of the things, well, two things that I've learned from Ev's humanity and they deal with children. Well, first of all, when we publish, we have our CV, no? Curriculum Vita. And uh, that's important. No? All the books you may have written are important. Diffusion of innovations, communication technology, blah, 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 blah. But one of the hu humanitarian things that I learned from Ev is that has its place. But perhaps even more important are the books that you have read to your children that are not on your Vita. Yeah? Think about that for a minute. How many books have I read to my children that are not on my Vita? We tend to value a certain form of authorship, scholarship. Yeah? But how about if we flip it? Also, uh, people often ask me, what do you want your sons to be? I have two. And I think this is sort of the Ev Rogers in my DNA. I have no aspirations for what they become, really. And you know, you're asked this question. My only aspiration for them is, I just want them to be a good human being. It's as simple as that. You may excel in whatever, you may, you know, just be a good human being, as Ev was. Not commander in chief, not president, not a tall man being. And maybe I'll just end by saying that, you know, we don't choose our parents, but our parents choose each other, no? They must. Likewise, it is highly important that we pay attention to whom we choose as mentors. Highly important. Of course, you have a professor, you have a research professor, you have a co-author, but it's highly important that we pay emphasis to whom we select as a mentor, because the mentor will then also pay attention to you. Ev was forever a farmer. This is a couple of years before he passed, and we can just end with this slide, because here's an Ev farm boy who never left his roots. No, he was always farming. He was always preparing the soil. He was seeding ideas. He was watering them. He was removing the weeds so that they could flourish. And that's how I felt as a student. So when he passed, uh, I was very honored that Corin would take me to his Iowa farm where we returned his ashes to the farm. And maybe we just say thank you, Ev Rogers, a leading light. Yeah. Thank you. Avin, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I, I told Avin that I didn't expect that we would be here uh, talking about, about F. I think I met you last uh, at Ohio University, right? Eons I visited. I visited. I remember 2006 or something. 
something, yeah. I was head of school then, chair of school, and then, um, and you were actually going to visit F, and you said he was not well, and I, I missed that, yeah. Okay, so it, it must have been a before Before that, yeah, right, right. Um, yeah, so the rich, uh, rich memories, um, I would say that, uh, Avin, you've, you've diffused the F's uh, DNA already, you know, in a mannerism. There's a division of, 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 of mannerism there. Uh, I see many of you are, are students. Um, you should know that uh, F. Rogers has a big influence on the school, um, and uh, the influence is not necessarily what you can see, and it's, it's in culture, it's in culture of school. Uh, there's a saying that culture is a uh, strategy for, for breakfast mm -hmm. or lunch, yeah. Um, and and uh, in, in his case, it's a, it's a friendly, collegial atmosphere that he has uh, inculcated. Um, you, you hear him talk about, you, you talked a few times about the scorpion, so I guess I have to talk a bit about the scorpion, right? So we used to take uh, distinguished professors to this restaurant uh, in Beach Road called uh, Imperial Herbal. <coughs> Um, when you walk in, you would see um, uh, uh, a Chinese medicine kind of shop, and then the restaurant. So actually, you go in, you get your pal taken, your tongue, look at the fur of the tongue, and then, and then they give you food. You used to order the food based on what the Chinese uh, physician would, would recommend. <coughs> Among them was scorpion and ants, from China, of course. It's a place where actually the, the, the Chinese um, language celebrities hang out. No? Like the Chinese, you see... Chinese movie stars uh, hanging out there. And, and we didn't know, like, hey, we just went there for the food, right? Um, <clears throat> the scorpions and ants are no more because the Chinese have become more affluent, so they kind of retain the best stuff for themselves now. You can't find scorpion ants. It's not, all, it's not any ordinary ants because ants have got formic acid. You can't eat, so these ants are special and, you know, uh, to have there. Um, you break out the scorpion tail before you eat the scorpions. So you just like, it tastes a bit like a, like a fried prawn, so it's okay. So F, he, 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 what he did was he took a picture of him, him taking the, himself eating the, prawn, the scorpion and he showed it in his class on intercultural communication. This is then back in the U.S. Everybody's going, ooh, ah, you know, but he was like, oh, this is delicious and all that, right? So part of uh, his poking fun at, at, at the students uh, uh, with, with that. Um, F uh, was highly influential in, um, uh, of course, you see uh, in, in Denver, but also USC. I think when you went, USC wasn't a well-ranked university then. Uh, I, I remember because uh, a friend of mine, that we later met at Michigan State, went to Stanford, and he says, USC was called the University of Second Choice, right? Uh, but of course, it's since uh, uh, overtaken, and I think F played a big part in sort of moving it up, um, the ranking. He mentioned also the F was working all the time, and uh, what I remember was that he was in the canteen, I happened to meet him in the canteen, and he had a bag, he had his bag, with you know, sling bag, a letter sling bag, and he was reviewing papers. So he has sling bag, reviewing papers. So, so I guess if today he would carry maybe like, like a tablet and he'd be like, you know, reviewing the papers on the, uh, on the tablet. Um, one memory I have of him is that uh, I took a class. Um, I didn't take a Division of Innovations class because somehow it's packed and I kind of missed that, but I took one on development communication. It's an interesting class because in that class, and sort of everybody in the school knows, it's a class where you watch movies. You watch about six movies, and then you dis and then uh, you know you talk about it. Of course, um, I took it back to Singapore and I did it when you know Mascom was at NUS and we did it. The interesting thing was that uh, it was for the honors class, so about maybe about fifteen students, so about twelve to the class, and the other three who didn't take it said, "I, I don't know what you what, what you guys are doing, but everybody is talking about the the, 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 the class outside of class." Right, so the three who are taking, right, it was still they were, they were sort of forced to, to listen to these conversations about this class and how you know they were talking about these, all these issues, and I think it shows kind of um, the, the, both the power of, of imagination and kind of things you've done through, uh, you've done so that um, you are talking about topics outside of class, right? You typically don't do that, so you can you know you find something that is interesting, challenging, and uh, he managed to do that. Uh, one more point about and, and uh, you talk about his uh, humanity. Um, in that class that I took, um, I took two classes with him actually, yeah, that, that much I remember. Um, he came back after the ICA conference. It was ICA, this big conference that we go to. It was in, in May. He came back after that. And he said, you know, oh, I was at conference. And a graduate student criticized me. And I think she's right. I'm like, wow, you know, uh, a, a full professor being criticized by a grad student and saying that she is right. The graduate student was Robin Mansell. 
right? Uh, this so so like what well, like who is Robin Mansell, right? Well, now we know because she's just recently retired. Uh, she was a acting provost at LSE. Uh, she is uh, president of a big association, and I happen to have co co edited a volume uh, with her, right? Um, so uh, what you get is a is a picture of a man who is really as as um, Arvin has, has said, right? Uh, Friendly, collegial, humanitarian, yet operating at a very high level intellectually in in uh, in this field. Uh, our chair Jack talked about how the book is um, uh, cited in many areas. Uh, one area I kind of stumbled upon, which I was kind of surprised, was also fashion. Yeah. Was fashion changes? Yeah. So uh, when you talk about the spread of, of ideas, it's really really across. Um, we are lucky that we, in a school we are inheritors of this of this tradition. One more thing uh, before I step down. Uh, we had this uh, center called the Singapore Internet Research uh, Center. Uh, F inaugurated the first meeting. Uh, so this center was talking about internet research. So we had him come talk about it, talk about how we should you know, uh, organize the center. The center brought in about $6 million to the school uh, overall. Um, but the important thing uh, was this uh, 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 volume at the New Media Society where three of us had papers in that same issue, you can look it up, one, two, three, I think December 2020, uh, 2020 uh, December 2000 uh, volume, and again, it's uh, F's work. So I'm, I'm really happy that we have this opportunity to uh, further uh, discuss him and his, and his life and works as well. Okay, thank you. You have the mic there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Questions from the audience? <laughs> or comments? Now it is. So, Arvin, did Ev ever express a favorite place that he liked to go? He traveled all over the world. Did he ever express an, a particular place that, that stood out for him that you recall? You know, he was the kind of person that wherever he was would be his favorite place. I remember once, uh, I was a first year doctoral student. I arrived from Los Angeles to Bombay and then took a flight to a small city, Pune. And Ev was there on a project. He came to the airport, drove 30 miles with a chauffeur to pick up his graduate student. Would you believe that? No? And I said, Ev, you're here. And he said, this is the place I needed to be. So that's sort of your res you know, his response. I'm, I'm not surprised, actually. He's always very, very polite and generous. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Grace will pass you the microphone. Thank you. Um, my name is Nia Sarinastiti, and I'm from Atmajaya Catholic University in Indonesia. Just visiting uh, here. Been a while that uh, meeting Professor Ang as well. Um, I'm actually, my uh, PhD dissertation is also based on the book from Everett Rogers and also Professor Rocher's Contractors, uh, Communities of Networks. But what I wanted to say is that now I know where the inspiration of the stories from the India, from India, because now I'm it's very glad to be able to meet Dr. Arvin here. Um, so I was thinking, um, is there any other countries in Asia, in addition to India and Singapore, that he was he wanted to go, but he was not he was not able, or he was interested in? Thank you, uh, Professor Nia. You mentioned Noshir contractor. Uh, Noshir was uh, two years ahead of me at the Annenberg School 
and played a big role in recruiting uh, me to come to the Annenberg School because he was very afraid that I'd go to Stanford. <laughs> and I don't know if you saw a picture of Noshir. There was a picture of him. He was very young. We were all babies, no, uh, at at one point. Uh, so uh, there was I I uh, Ev had been to pretty much every country in Asia that uh, um, that I can think of. I mean, you know, India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, uh, Pakistan, uh, China, uh, Thailand. Malaysia, I mean, you know, I, uh, Indonesia, I have a picture of him uh, under a sort of a sweltering volcano in uh, Indonesia. Uh, uh, he, he was everywhere, and that is because uh, he loved to travel, uh, because, you know, uh, his ability to uh, connect with a new place or a new food or a new garb. Uh, was uh, an essential uh, part uh, of his persona. I mean, if we really tag down, maybe there was a country or two, Mongolia maybe, that he uh, didn't visit, although then he'd say, oh no, I was in Mongolia doing this or that. So I don't know. He, he was, and he was connected to these countries because of his students. No? Uh, so, he was connected to India during the time that I was his student in a special way because he had access to not just an Indian home but many Indian homes. And of course he had a relationship with India 20 years before I came into his life because he was married to an Indian woman at one time and you know, uh, so was connected in other ways. So I think his reach was uh, phenomenally global because he always said his favorite line when it came to his students, his mentoring philosophy was, all my life I have planted little acorns and I have watched them grow into trees. So when I was uh, returning his ashes to his beloved farmlands in Iowa, one of the things I did was I collected acorns from the field. And that's the picture that you probably saw because it was deeply symbolic that one of the acorns which he helped nourish was back there picking uh, some acorns. And these acorns were planted in different parts of the world. Now you can see. Is it on? Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, I was thinking, you know, um, great writers are measured sometimes by how long their pieces last and stay relevant. And you have, you have those that that centuries later are relevant. And I think Ev Rogers' uh, theory, um, decades after he created it, is still live and kicking and, and very, very relevant. Um, and this is one of the reasons that I was rushing to come here and listen. Um, but I was thinking, you know, when you talked about the uh, entertainment um, as, 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 as a tool um, for um, diffusion of, of ideas or social change, uh, I was thinking about social media, I was thinking about TikTok, but I was also thinking about the diffusion of disinformation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and what would he say about not spreading it, but stopping it these days with the tools that he created? Ooh. With what's happening uh, in the United States uh, and what's going to happen in a couple of weeks, uh, <laughs> the echo chamber of disinformation, I'm sure Ev would have an opinion uh, uh, on it. Uh, but back to the point that you first made, I think his theory is going to be relevant timelessly 
Why? Because there are yet newer innovations every day. Yeah. Fashion. You know, it keeps changing. So uh, th this field has longevity because, <laughs> you know, there are yet newer innovations every day. And there are yet newer issues which need to be addressed every day, like disinformation. Yeah. And you know, I mean, Ev was very aware of pro-innovation bias. He, uh, at great length, uh, discussed the ethics of innovation. You know, who decides? And you know, he was his own best self-critic, like a student who said something, and Ev said, "Yeah, I think she's right." No, constantly revisiting his own ideas. But boy, it is, uh, I, I would be really interested in what Ev would say about this echo chamber where things keep reverberating and look what's happening. You know, we're all very worried. It's unbelievable to us, to some of us, <laughs> to half of us in the US that a wild, uh, corrupt, uh, dishonest, Convict, liar, you know, I mean, I, this is not a political stage, but why not? Yeah, is, uh, uh, this is his third term. I mean, this is his third election consecutively. So something's clearly happening, you know? Yeah. Yes, oh yeah. Um, hi, I'm Jermaine. I have a just quick question. Is, uh, what's the most valuable lesson you took away from Evie Roger and how has that impacted your professional work? Well, that's a beautiful question. I, I'd say, you know, the wish that we have for our children, uh, Ev's longevity, his connective sinew is, in my opinion, uh, explained by his uh, humanity. He was more than a teacher. He was more than a researcher. He was more than a professor. He took care of our emotional intellectual, spiritual needs. And so in that sense, you know, the notion of guru uh, that we have in India, who's a guru? A guru is one who drives darkness away, right? And there's so much darkness around us. So uh, uh, I, I hope uh, uh, the little uh, interaction that I have with my students uh, with my colleagues, uh, we create that space of deep understanding. Doesn't mean agreement. Uh, and I think that's the, I learned a few things from him in class, uh, but I think uh, with Ev you learn a lot more about how to learn, as opposed to learning, you know, what you can. And that is a tremendous uh, gift, I think. When somebody can teach you how to be curious, how to uh, learn, how to engage, how to be, that is a far deeper impact. So thank you for that question. And thank you, Grace, for being graceful to bring me water. You probably saw I was losing so much of it <laughs> that, oh, a professor may be dehydrated. Okay. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be able to introduce our uh, second speaker. Uh, I've known her for, for a few years now. Uh, she's Professor Dorian Katikawangi uh, from the Catholic University of Amajaya. Uh, she's currently the Dean of the Faculty of Business, Administration, and Communication Science. Um, so I, I think uh, in, in, uh, in Singapore, we, we don't look too much at uh, Indonesia. For, for things like communication, but some things to, to, to observe. Our, somebody said that the Singapore flag is um, modeled after the Indonesian flag. Red at the top, white at the bottom, that's the Indonesian flag, but we added a moon and crescent, uh, moon and, and the stars, and that's our Singapore flag. 
And it's supposed to, to sort of show that we are a little brother to the big brother Abang, the big brother in, in Indonesia. Um, Indonesia's population is about that of the, the USA, and if trends continue, it would be bigger, it would be bigger uh, you know, dec decades down the road than, uh, than the USA. So we have a USA in kind of in our backyard. It's an hour odd uh, flight to Jakarta, less even by boat, uh, you know, to, to Banta, uh, Batam and uh, Bintang. Um, Professor Katika Wangyi, or Doreen as I know her, um, has played a very instrumental role in this space. Um, Indonesia, for historical reasons, has not really been uh, international in communication uh, work. So she has managed to pool together the various groups, disparate groups of, uh, of Indonesian uh, scholars, so that they've organized the first ever international conference a couple of years ago. And they invited me as the speaker there. Um, what is so special about it? There is the your your secular, you could say like us, uh, universities, but it's also a, a uh, Islamic university. The Islamic university is kind of interesting because uh, currently, currently, and but going changes, of course, they see communication as a way to preach. So communication is in a preaching department. Of course, we know it is not right. Um, so they're definitely going to move away from that that model. Um, but the Islamic communication, uh, Islamic universities, I think the big uh, thing that they have in, in, the, in the kind of their favor is they've, they've set very high standards in things like ethics. You know, corruption is a major uh, problem. It's a big country, uh, and you know, uh, it, it's easy to kind of get, get away with things. So the, the um, Islamic scholars are very critical of administration on both sides. So I've been talking about not those politically affected, but those who are really uh, true scholars. So somehow, Doreen has managed to pull these disparate groups. And notice that she is uh, a female, right? And, and I notice that female work harder than the males, <laughs> certainly in many places. Uh, and in Indonesia, I see that too. So she managed to pull them together. Um, so I see her as a, as a driving force. Uh, down the road, she will eventually, I mean, have a big part to play in definitely driving uh, this uh, communication research. She's, she's uh, currently also adjunct professor at the uh, Faisal University in Philippines uh, and, and has uh, given uh, lectures in uh, many parts of the world, especially now, most recently in Burgundy. We just have some very good of my mind. Okay, so on that note, I invite Dorian to come uh, give us her address. Yeah. Thank you so much, Prof. Ang Pengwa, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I also would like to thank you. To thanks, Prof. Jack, for the invitations, and also Prof. Afin for the wonderful talks. I think um, understanding how deep is your engagement with if it's a very, you know, inspiring, especially in understanding about epistemology, ontology, and the axiology of the his theories. So I'm not that uh, engaged with Rogers as a personal, but I learn his theory and his thought and then try to implement it because um, from my point of view, diffusion and innovation is really related to our daily life now, especially because of the um, technology and information technology that grew rapidly, undeniable. So my talk will be about digital metamorphosis, empowering rural resilience, and sustainability through communication strategies, because my uh, focus on um, communication studies is on the uh, communication strategies. So um, I would like to start my talk with um, a bit explanation on Indonesia because as Prof Pengwa mentioned earlier that maybe you you not really know about Indonesia, right? So we can come to next slide, please. Oh, okay, sorry. This one. Yeah, okay. This is Indonesia. 
Indonesia is huge archipelagos, and we are from the west to east. Our capital city is Jakarta, and now we also have Ibu Kota Nusantara in Kalimantan. We are has um, 267 million populations and um, has 18,000 islands, also 1,300 ethnic groups with 700 uh, languages. So you can imagine how diverse we are. But we have one language uh, called Bahasa Indonesia. I think uh, some of you understand Malay a bit the uh, same, but not the whole. <laughs> and, and yeah, we have uh, very diverse languages and also race and ethnic groups. So that's kind of, um, um, how do you say? Uh, added value, but also challenges at the same time. Yeah. So by understanding this uh, figure, we, we can also understand that Indonesia uh, have a frontier, utmost, and least developed regions of uh, referred to as a um, treaty, terdepan, terluar, tertinggal region. So we also concerned about that uh, even though in the big city we still have a problem in in um, uh, innovation matters, such as we talk about, um, for example, smart city, uh, e-health, and everything. But again, my talk will be concerned about rural areas and how a strategic communication plays significant roles in. Um, uh, the development and also the sustainability. So we understand the transformation of rural communities in digital age is a significant, significant global phenomenon presenting both unprecedented opportunities and complex challenges. As digitalizations expand into this often under underserved areas, it becomes critical to ensure that communication strategies are in place to enable sustainable development and resilience. So the digital transformation of rural areas is a double-edged sword. While offering unprecedented opportunities for growth, education, and connectivity, it also presents challenges related to infrastructure, digital literacy, and also social adaptation. Communication strategies are at the heart of these transformations, and communication is the backbone of this transformation, acting as the medium through which rural communities can adopt, adapt, and integrate digital technologies into their everyday lives. They bridge the gap between technology and the lived uh, realities of rural communities, ensuring that digital innovations are not only introduced, but also integrated in ways that promote sustainability and resilience. By grounding this analysis in every Rogers diffusion and innovation theory, this presentation examines the opportunities and challenges of digital transformation in rural areas. Also, how communication strategies can play a pivotal role in rural digitalizations, and it will explore the dynamics of rural society, communication strategies for sustainability, the enhancement of community resilience and the importance of collaborative partnership. Also discuss gaps between theoretical frameworks and practical implementations and proposes communication strategies for addressing these gaps. Okay, so understanding the uh, rural society and digital era, why it's so important? Rural communities are traditionally characterized by close-knit social structure 
limited access to infrastructure and a slower rate of technology adoption. The introduction of digital technology into this setting can disrupt existing social norms and economic activities while simultaneously providing new avenues for growth, education, and participation. However, rural communities face unique challenges such as, as the digital divides, lower levels of technological infrastructure and varying degrees of digital literacy, making the communication of innovation a critical element in fostering successful digital transformations. If diffusion inform, uh, and innovation theories provides a powerful framework for understanding how rural communities adapt digital tools over time, the theory emphasizes that adoption process influenced by five key factors. Yeah, Prof. Arvin already explained it. Relative advantage, how innovation improve upon existing solutions. Compatibility, how the innovation fit with the values and needs of the community. Complexity, the degree to which the innovation is perceived as difficult to understand or use and also trialability, the extent to which the innovation can be experimented with on limited basis. And the fifth is observability, how visible the result of the innovation are to others because uh, you know, information can be spread out and can be the uh, model for others. So in rural areas, Digital innovation ranging from e-government services to digital farming technologies are slowly penetrating social system. However, the adoption of this technology is often slow, hindered by the complex interplay between social structure, cultural norms, and limited technological infrastructure. Theoretical models uh, suggest that innovation with high relative advantage and compatibility sorry, are more likely to be adopted, but in rural context, digital solutions often fail to align with socio-economic realities of the community, especially in Indonesia. So in the context of rural digital transformation, communication strategies must emphasize these factors. For instance, rural areas where technology infrastructure is limited might benefit from highlighting the relative advantage of more based agricultural tools or telehealth services, especially in areas with poor physical access to traditional services. Moreover, rural communication strategies should focus on compatibility. I highlight the compatibility by aligning digital solution with local values and practices. Ensuring that technologies in, um, introduced are not only functional, but also cultural, culturally acceptable. Furthermore, Rogers categorized adopters into five groups um, innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and large. Its group's readiness to adopt technology differs, and communication must be tailored accordingly. Innovators and early adopters in rural communities often lead by example, while the early and late majority require more practical evidence of success and lower perceived risk before embracing innovation. The laggards may be the most resistant to change, requiring personalized and uh, culturally resonant uh, communication strategies. So the gap between Rogers theory and practical realities in rural digital transformation, especially in Indonesia, lies in the accessibility and usability of the digital tools. Rural areas often suffer from low internet penetration, inadequate digital infrastructure, and limited government investment. 
which complicated uh, complicates the adoption process. Uh, you know, the way long from the beginning to the end. And the in theory, the diffusion of digital technology should follow a predict predictable curve based on the innovation characteristic and the community's openness to change. However, in practice, digital divides and cultural resistance slow this process considerability. For example, while digital agriculture tools might offer substantial relative advantage, such as improved crop yields or market access, Rural farmers may view this innovation as incompatible with their traditional farming method. If you visit Indonesia from west to east, there are many farming methods. So it's really challenging to, to um, develop and to induce the, the uh, innovation. So moreover, highly high complexity in using digital tools may act as a barrier to adoption, particularly among the late majority and laggards within the community. Therefore, we can know um, how communication strategy is implemented for sustainability. Sustainability in rural areas extend beyond environmental concern to encompass economic viability, social cohesion, and the ability to thrive despite external uh, pressure. Digitalization offers tools that can enhance this facet, but only if integrated without thoughtful communication strategies. So effective communication in rural setting must save from traditional one-way communication methods of disseminating information to two-way participatory models, fostering dialogue and engagement. So effective communication for sustainability involves moving beyond one-way dissemination of information to more uh, participatory models. Two-way communication is characterized by dialogue, transparency, and accountability, and it ensures that all stakeholders, especially those in rural communities, are involved in the conversations around digital transformations. This participatory approach aligns with the principles of development communication with emphasize empowerment, engagement, and also this is the most important thing, capacity building for the uh, rural community. In the theory, two-way communication should foster an environment where rural communities actively contribute to the digitalization process. However, in practice, many communication initiatives in rural areas remain top-down. Focusing on dissemination, disseminating information rather than fostering engagement. So always from the government to the community. Government programs, for instance, may implement digital literacy campaign that tell communities what they should adopt rather than listening to their needs, concern, and feedback. So moreover, while transparency and accountability are vital for building trust, Rural communities often view digital technologies with suspicious, especially when they are perceived as tools of uh, surveillance or control. The gap here lies in the value of communication strategies to uh, contextualize the digital tools within the social fabric of rural life, leading to mistrust and resistance to adoption. One of the most pressing challenges in rural development is the promotion of digital literacy. Without the skills to eff effectively use digital tools, rural communities may struggle to realize the benefit of digital transportation, transformation. Communication strategies must therefore prioritize education and training in digital skills. 
public information campaign, digital literacy workshop, and partnership with local schools and community leaders can significantly enhance the accessibility and usability of digital tools. So here I will under, uh, underscore the opinion leaders and change agent. Because trusted community figures, local government officials, and NGO workers play an indispensable role in promoting these strategies. Drawing from Roger's theory, these figures serve as conduit for innovation, encouraging community members to embrace the new technologies by showcasing success stories and demonstrating how digital solutions align with local needs. That's uh, really important. The bridge between gap between external innovation and community ac acceptance, ensuring that communication about digital transformation is not only top-down but rooted in the local context. To bridge these gaps, communication strategies need to focus on cultural alignment and local adaptation of digital tools. One opportunity lies in developing tailor messaging that speaks to the specific needs and values of rural communities. For example, communication campaign promoting digital literacy should emphasis on these technologies can complement rather than replace traditional methods. So the um, three points that I would like, two points that I would like to emphasize is localized demonstrations, demonstrating the practical localized benefits of digital innovation can enhance observability and trialability. And farmers, for instance, could be invited to observe how digital tools improve crop management in nearby farms, giving them a clear real world example of how technology can work from the, from them. The second is engaging community leaders. Communication should engage trusted local figures or opinion leaders, such as religious leader, village head, and influential farmers who can act as early adopters and advocates for change. These individuals are pivotal in promoting the relative advantage of new technologies in ways that resonate with the community's cultural and context. So to ensure sustainability communication strategies must foster transparency and accountability, and this involves opening channels for community feedback on new technologies and ensuring that policies or intervention related to digital tools reflect the concern and the need of local population. This participatory approach can enhance trust stakeholders um, creating co cooperative environment in which digital solution can be co-created and uh, refined based community input. This is um, the model that I developed with some colleagues in understanding how culture plays significant roles in diffusion and innovation. Because, for example, be, I talk about, on, on the perspective of communication strategies if the organization or company uh, has a HR strategy, they have to think about the cultural competencies. Because when they want to uh, not only, you know, looking for profit, but also uh, concern on the community development, they have to also understand the culture. Even from the marketing, you cannot sell product or services if, if you don't understand the culture of the community, especially in Indonesia with the range of um, various um, culture. So the communication strategy should emphasize co-creation and feedback loops. This ensure that digital solutions are not only tailored to local context, but also receive community input during the planning and implementing phase. Okay. 
participatory workshop, collaborative messaging, and transparent reporting will be the three points that uh, uh, that we have to understand in the uh, developing the strategic planning of communication and also the eval the implementation and yet the evaluation. So we come to the um, enhancing resilience in rural communities. I don't know why it's, um, you know, it's okay. Resilience is the ability of rural communities to absorb shocks, whether environmental, economic, or social, and recover in ways uh, that do not compromise their long-term sustainability. Digital technologies have the potential to enhance resilience by improving communication, fostering innovation, and providing a new um, avenues for economic diversification. And however, without strategic communications, rural areas fail to fully leverage these tools. The role of communication in enhancing climate resilience is paramount. Digital platform, for example, can be used to disseminate real-time weather updates, share knowledge about climate smart agriculture practices, or facilitate early warning system for natural disaster. A communication strategy focuses on proactive information sharing, ensure that rural communities are equipped with the knowledge and tools to mitigate the impact of climate-related shocks. Because sometimes they just don't understand why the climate is changed and they fail to harvest their crops. So education is really important. The diffusion of such innovation should be framed in ways that emphasize trialability and observability. So it's give time to the farmer. Allowing community members to see tangible benefits before fully committing. Economic resilience. Similarity in enhanced through communication channel that support economic diversification, digital technology can connect rural business to broader market. We know the um, small enterprise that we have to have uh, and, and how to market their, their product, for example. Provide financial literacy training and create platform for local entrepreneurship. Effective communication strategies must focus on building trust in digital financial tools, especially in communities where traditional economic practices dominate. Sometimes barter is still exists in Indonesia rural communities. This can be achieved through partnership with local cooperative, which often have strong social capital and influence within rural communities. So uh, the theory of communication of development and social change, for example, emphasizes the role of communication in facilitating social economic transformation that enhance community resilience. Resilience in this context refers to a community ability to adapt and recover from economic and for environmental and social shocks um, such as those caused by climate change or economic disruptions. And communication, according to this theory, play a critical role in promoting Resilience by enabling knowledge exchange, fostering collective action, and ensuring timely access to information. So to close the gap between theory and practices in rural setting often arise from communication bottlenecks. With CDSG process that communication should be multi-layered and involve a wide range of stakeholders in practice, rural areas frequently experience a lack of access to communication technology and resources. For example, early warning system for climate-related events 
which could drastically improve rural resilience are often enabled due to poor infrastructure, uh, infrastructure and low digital literacy. Another gap exists in the perceived usefulness of digital tools for enhancing resilience. Theoretical models suggest that digital innovation should enhance community resilience by improving access to information and resources. However, rural communities may not immediately see the benefits of such tools unless communication strategies explicitly demonstrate their value in the local context. To close these gaps, communication strategies must focus on building trust capacity and infrastructure, uh, as I mentioned earlier. So here we see that Roger's idea of reinvention, the process by which communities adapt innovation to fit their own needs, plays crucial role in resilience building. Communication strategies should encourage communities to modify, to modify the digital tools in ways that align with their local context, ensuring that digital innovation are not only adopted but also sustained. In doing so, rural communities can develop locally appropriate solutions that are more likely to endure. So this is uh, the model that I developed on how collaborative partnership for rural sustainability works. Actually, we know that collaborative partnership between public and private entities, local communities, and grassroots organized are essential for the sustainable integration of digital technologies in rural areas. You can see in the model here that company, environment, government, and society also uh, advocate by media. So we can use media, the, um, the traditional one, and new media to, um, to advocate and also, um, how do you say, spread out the information of the uh, development. Here, um, this is for the young generation, actually. <laughs> we know that not only conventional media such as television, newspaper, even digital newspaper or radio that can play a significant role in developing and diffusing the innovation, but we understand that there are many social media that can play significant roles in echoing this uh, innovation. Why? Of course, you can, you can see TikToks, you know, many uh, content are very creative, but somehow uh, poisoned <laughs> to the young generation, yeah? But again, you can, you can also contribute your content to um, amplification and to echoing the diffusion and innovation. So it's not start by paid or earn or share, but should be start by own media. We have our own media. I think you have more than one social media, perhaps Instagram, Facebook, Oh, Facebook is in my generation. <laughs> Maybe TikTok, podcast, yeah, lot of media that you can um, develop a very nice content and um, you know supporting this uh, innovation uh, diffusion of innovation. So that kind of um, collaborative uh, social responsibility are very crucial nowadays, especially in Indonesia. Therefore, we can understand that um, multi-stakeholders, multi-stakeholders communication model emphasize the importance of collaboration 
between diverse actors, governments, private companies, NGOs, and local community to address complex development challenges. This model suggests that sustainability can be achieved when all stakeholders contribute their expertise and resources and when there is open, continuous communication between them. So, um, I would like to uh, conclude just more. So, oh, I would like to highlight the the a theory, the gap of the theory and practice here. In the theory, multi-stakeholder partnership should ensure that rural communities receive the support they need to integrate digital technology sustainability. However, in practice, this partnership often lack the coordination and communication necessary to be effective. So we need coordination and communication. And the gap lies in the value to develop coherent communication strategies that align the objective of all stakeholders with the needs of rural community. So to address this challenge, communication strategies should focus on building bridge. Building bridges between stakeholders, ensuring that each actors understand their role in supporting rural digital transformation. As a conclusion, the digital metamorphosis of rural areas requires communication strategies that are deeply rooted in the con local context, tailored to the specific needs of rural communities, and grounded in theoretical frameworks like Rogers' diffusion of innovation theories, but again, please be careful with local context, norms, and culture. By fostering digital literacy, promoting collaborative partnership, and ensuring that innovation are both adopted and adapted, communication can empower rural areas to thrive in the digital era. Through these strategies, rural communities can enhance their resilience to economic and environmental challenges while promoting sustainable development. Communication is not just a tool for delivering information, but a liquid of enabling rural transformation in a way that is inclusive, participatory, and sustainable. The digital metamorphosis of rural areas requires profound and strategic communications that bridges the gap between theoretical models and practical realities. While theories like Rogers' Diffusion of Innovation and CDSC offer valuable insight into how digital technologies can enhance rural resilience and sustainability, their practical implementation faces significant challenges. So communication strategies must be adaptive participatory and culturally sensitive to ensure that digital innovation are not only adopted but also embraced by rural communities in ways that align with their socio-economic context. Through collaborative partnership, two-way communication, and a focus on resilience, rural area can thrive in the digital era, achieving sustainable development that is both inclusive and equitable. So that's all my talks. I think um, while Prof. Arvin talking about the concept and how the theory developed, and I um, talk about how it's implemented, especially in Indonesia context. So thank you so much for the opportunity. I give back the time to the moderator. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Doreen. I had very high expectation for her presentation, and what you just said uh, far exceeded my uh, high expectations. Uh, considering time, I'm just going to make one general comment, okay, which is uh, the need to pay more attention to rural areas as communication scholars. Globally, 
uh, communication scholars have been focusing so much you know, on urban issues. And in Singapore, we almost pay exclusive attention. Right? So this is, uh, but we have to remember we are part of the world. Okay, the world's urbanization now, according to UN, is 55%. Right? 45% of the world population still live in the countryside. But in Southeast Asia, our average, the whole region's uh, urbanization level is 45%. It's 10% lower okay, than the world average. So still more Southeast Asian uh, people live in the countryside than in the cities. Uh, Indonesia actually has 58%. is higher than the uh, regional average. And uh, Singapore, uh, we are almost uh, all urban. Okay, but we are very exceptional. So in order to be able to understand uh, our region and also making a distinct uh, contribution, scholarly or practical contribution, we have to understand you know, the rural context, okay, as diverse as they are, like that uh, uh, Professor Doreen, Doreen uh, you know, pointed out. And uh, we often assume right, that the latest technology is the best. The most expensive ones are the better ones. Right? However, from this talk, we understand it's not it's the, the most expensive or the most cutting edge, but it's the, those that are more compatible. Okay, not only with individual consumers, but with communities of farmers with their own cultural, religious, okay, uh, local uh, context. So with this, uh, uh, listening to, talk, talk, to the talk make me want to go back and read two more of uh, two old articles by uh, uh, Professor Ab Rogers. We talk about the book a lot already. One is 1976. He wrote an article called The Passing of the Paradigm, the Dominant Paradigm in which he made a lot of reference to Asian examples, Chinese and India, as ways to see how uh, you know, uh, the world communication scholar can learn from okay, uh, family planning or uh, 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 rural organizers and communicators in Asia. Another article was from the 2003 Communication Yearbook, co-authored by uh, Professor Ev Rogers and Arvin Singo uh, on the dialogic model of communication, which would contribute to the resilience and the sustainability of uh, you know, long-term change, not just short-term. So I will end my uh, comments here you know, by giving two more footnotes to what uh, Professor Doreen has uh, presented so wonderfully. And I'm sure when if uh, uh, Professor Ev Rogers is listening, smiling at us, he could probably will not be more delighted, you know, he couldn't be to see the new acrons that he plants now growing in Indonesia and also in our digital, okay, uh, communication age. Thank you. So, yes. So, uh, just a very quick q and I know the uh, food is outside. <laughs> Any question? Oh, I see. Okay, I'm, okay. Yeah. Oh. oh, so the haze example of where it is not sustainable, right? But if you, I, I've happened to visit the area there. Uh, you know that they, they, to some extent, are burning because the livelihood has been uh, dependent on that, and they sort of use the model. So I think, uh, uh, Dorian, your your work is really important. How do you? tell them that what they're doing is not sustainable in the long run, right? So I think these are very important questions uh, affecting us, not just like, oh, it's only in Indonesia, it's really affecting us. Okay. Questions, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure, very, yeah. Sorry about that. I think we can treat it also as a metaphor, not just a rural er uh, area, but marginalized um, groups in society and thinking about people with disabilities. I think about the aging population. Uh, Singapore is a super aging society. Uh, I think it's relevant to all.
Thank you so much for the comment. Yes, I'm agree with it because when we when we talk about uh, communication strategies, especially in uh, diffusion of innovations, actually it touch uh, every single areas in our life. Even for the children, women, uh, disabilities person, or even for the uh, cities like Singapore's, well, Singapore's is country and city as well. <laughs> yeah, still, every time, every time uh, people ask about innovation. I have colleague, um, he is the um, uh, AI society uh, president in Indonesia. And when we discuss, he explained about how technological person always asks for innovation. Sometimes they forget who will use this innovation. So finally, he come to the um, um, conclusion that they cannot work alone. They have to go to the community, discuss with all the communities what they need so they can I uh, innovate any technology that are uh, uh, fit with the community needs. So I think your comment is really, really good to this. Thank you. Hi. Um, can you suggest some tools uh, to which you mentioned about uh, emo tackling emotional competencies? Uh. So in rural context, uh, can you suggest some tools uh, through which uh, these emotional competencies can be handled uh, so that we have more adopters for innovation? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, in rural communities, we deal with many layers of uh, society right so when we come to the emotional we we have to understand especially their need culture and norm yeah and uh, our communication strategies should be uh, fit with their their method that are acceptable for the culture and norms especially for you know not always has to be in the groups, some sometimes you can just chit chat with them in the warung. Warung is small store, and have a food and drink, and then, and then uh, start to have a conversations, and um, we can we can infuse them with all the information that are uh, about the innovation itself. But we can understand their emotional. Uh, background um, clearly, so we can we can choose uh, the how do you say uh, in Indonesia because we have many many ethnic races and languages. If we we cannot choose the the best words to influence them, it will be failed. So yeah, it's it's really hard. So it's kind of somehow they feel resistance or emotionally hurt because we we make a wrong apa, um, sentences or perhaps expressions things like that. So how is the tools? The tools some sometimes it's really. Uh, traditional touch of personal touch and then community and then uh, a group so not always with the tools of media for example as i explained before so personal touch is really important and this matters yeah i hope it's um, it's clear i don't know is it clear Uh, we've seen how communication innovations have aided the spread of information, but recently we've also seen how it has aided the spread of misinformation and disinformation. 
So what implications will this have on rural areas where digital literacy is not that high and what can be done to stem it? Thank you for the um, uh, very good questions, especially from young generation. <laughs> yeah, because uh, yes, there is, there is a misinformation, disinformation, and also malinformation. Malinformation is purposefully um, uh, create to to you know to rain something you know so uh, facing those uh, challenges actually our government already already blocked some information bad information but it's not the only the only ways we have uh, education lit uh, digital literacy educations and again I will I will uh, suggest to have, you know, like opinion leaders as Rogers theories. We really need opinion leaders that are, how do you say, um, trusted, have the credibility in the, uh, in the rural area. It's not always the government institution have. Usually, like Tetua Adat, culturally head of the cultural uh, communities or uh, ulama it's a, a kind of priest in in islam yeah so we have to know who are who are the the opinion leader in this area by them we can explain which one is the misinformation and disinformation and malinformation it's not that easy as I said, but we work, we have to work on it. Yeah, and the, this digital uh, social media and everything is really, really influence uh, our way of life right now. I don't know, you maybe uh, don't bother if you leave your wallet at home, but when you don't have your handphone and your hand, <laughs> you're going nuts, perhaps, yeah? Even for us, like the X generations. So yes, the information is overload, and not, it on, uh, not all information is correct. So we really need to, to go deeper with the communities, especially the rural communities, not easily to uh, to trust to the information. The thing is, one small addition, there is a, a word of mouth that usually influence the community. So even not the digital word of mouth, e word of mouth such as misinformation, disinformation everywhere in in the digital um, space, but in rural community, because they are communal, not individual, talking to each other is really important. That's why opinion leader play a significant role in this context. So yeah, uh, women usually cook and they tell stories and and on and on, talking about other people, talking about something that somehow can be misinformation. So we can use this kind of uh, this kind of model to influence people and to understand uh, uh, the misinformation, malinformation, and disinformation. So the education or the uh, literacy of information not always in the formal ways, but can be informal ways. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, we have to end this session with a few notes of thank you. Right? Uh, first, I want to say thank you, Professor Rogers. All right? <laughs> yes. And uh, uh, the, the, the discussion I just heard from our last question and also from Doreen actually reminds me exactly of the beginning of the fifth edition 
of in, uh, uh, diffusion innovation from the, the story about how in rural Peru in 1960, how they spread the new idea of you have to boil your water before you drink it. Right? And that uh, how it was uh, successful or not successful, it depends on the location of the opinion leader in the local community social structure. Right, so so we need to understand, you know, the, the the if we want to have a media literacy campaign in rural area, we have to understand the uh, the innovators and the opinion leaders are at the center of the local okay network. That essentially is what uh, uh, we have learned from uh, uh, Prof. F. Rogers from his, his work on Peru, but also from uh, in today in Indonesia. So we see, even though time has changed, technology have changed. But the lesson is the same. So thank you, Professor Rogers. Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. And uh, thank you, our inaugural speakers, for the Leading Lights uh, 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 theory. You are true luminaries. And I want to also thank Rubini and uh, Grace of our ACRC Research Center and uh, our comms team, right? yes, and our tech team. Some of them are still in the control room. You know, without your help, this wouldn't be possible. And I know they will still be working on the video to put it online. So when it's online, please help uh, diffuse the innovation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.